A cana não nasceu no Brasil, mas fez do Brasil a sua casa. Muito antes das grandes colheitadeiras cruzarem esse chão e das modernas usinas dominarem o horizonte, nosso açúcar já conquistava o mundo. Trazendo divisas, gerando progresso, virando sinônimo de Brasil mundo afora, num ciclo que parecia não ter fim. Mas não ficou por aí, pois a cana é forte e generosa como a nossa gente. E o que era só alimento virou combustível, energia e bioplástico. Soluções sustentáveis, abundantes e ecológicas, feitas para um mundo que não pode parar. Exatamente como um canavial. Safra após safra após safra. importante quanto cuidar da sua cana hoje é estar preparado para os desafios do amanhã e contar com a parceria de quem está sempre olhando lá na frente, pesquisando, desenvolvendo, trabalhando cada vez mais ao seu lado para levar soluções inovadoras e sustentáveis de um amplo portfólio de produtos que protege sua cana, do plantio à colheita. Tudo para que você tenha uma produção abundante, rentável e com matéria-prima de alta qualidade. Hoje, e sempre. Porque o futuro da cana é como o da sua próxima safra. Para colher bem lá na frente, é preciso plantar certo agora. E para nós, acreditar no poder da cana é mais do que valorizar quem a produz, mas inovar cada vez mais para que o setor não pare de crescer. Linha Cana Corteva Agrissaias. Ao lado de quem produz, hoje e amanhã. Olá, seja bem-vindo ao maior congresso técnico de bioenergia do mundo. Em instantes, você assistirá a um dos painéis de nossas 12 salas temáticas. Ao todo, serão mais de 60 horas de conteúdos ricos, divididos em 29 painéis liderados por mais de 200 palestrantes e moderadores. Tudo isso graças ao apoio dessas empresas que acreditam em nosso setor. Apoio Ouro, Agrobiológica, Basf, Bayer, Corteva, FMC, Copert, KPMG, Singenta, Ubifol, UPL, Apoio Prata e Rara, Suez, Totos. Apoio Bronze, Jacto, Cicobi Paulista. Fique agora com o nosso painel. Agradecemos sua participação e nos vemos em nossos próximos painéis. Um ótimo congresso a todos. 14º Congresso Nacional da Bioenergia, onde a inteligência do setor se reúne.
Bom dia a todos, sejam todos muito bem-vindos ao 14º Congresso Nacional da Bioenergia. Hoje nós estamos iniciando os trabalhos desta semana, onde nós teremos mais 10 lives, né, de segunda até sexta-feira, sempre às 10 e às 14 horas, divididos em 12 salas temáticas. E hoje temos a grande oportunidade de realizarmos o segundo painel internacional do nosso Congresso, hoje tratando sobre a perspectiva global para o mercado de açúcar até 2030. Em nome da UDOP, da nossa diretoria, nosso presidente Amaury Peckman, nosso presidente executivo Antônio César Salib, gostaríamos de agradecer a participação de todos, em especial é, dos nossos painelistas aqui, que estão dividindo conosco essa oportunidade de, nessa manhã aqui no Brasil, noite aí na Índia, nós temos né, é, representantes no painel também da Ásia, e gostaríamos de realmente dar as boas-vindas a todos. Espero que tenhamos um ótimo painel é, com as discussões desse importante mercado que está em efervescência é, nos últimos dias, é, principalmente em decorrência dos números da safra brasileira, né, os números que é, estão sendo impactados por uma forte seca e também é, algumas geadas que atingiram algumas regiões produtoras de cana-de-açúcar. Né? Então, gostaríamos de realmente agradecer a participação de todos e, é, em especial, gostaríamos de agradecer né, ao Dr. José Urive, ele que é presidente da Associação Internacional do Açúcar, né, a ISO, International Sugar Organization, e ele que aceitou aqui o nosso é, convite, né, é, convite feito pelo nosso braço internacional, no nosso congresso, que é o APLA, né, o Arranjo Produtivo Local do, Al, do Álcool, né, através do, do Flávio Castellari, seu, seu diretor. Né, então, gostaríamos de agradecer, doutor Oribe, por ter aceitado é, esse desafio de poder moderar o nosso painel. Ele que está é, na Guatemala. Né, é, muito obrigado, doutor Oribe, por aceitar o nosso convite. Né. É, nesse painel, nós teremos, então, também as visões de Brasil, Estados Unidos e Índia. Né, infelizmente, nós tivemos um problema de conexão com o nosso é, painelista da Tailândia, ele está tentando entrar ainda, não é? mas já estão aqui conosco né, nossos representantes. Eu gostaria de agradecer, em nome da UDOP, ao Marcelo Mancini Estela, vice-presidente comercial e logística do Grupo Ativos, Dr. Jack Honey, diretor de economia e análise política da American Sugar Alliance, e na, pela Índia, Dr. Adir Jha, que é diretor administrativo e CEO da ISEC. Então, mais uma vez, muito obrigado. Além do doutor Orive, é, CEO do ISO, eu gostaria, então, de passar a palavra já para o nosso moderador para que ele possa tocar esse nosso painel. Muito obrigado, que tenhamos um ótimo painel. E o público pode é, estar nos enviando as perguntas que acharem é, importantes através do nosso chat, tanto aqui na plataforma do Zoom, né, é, quanto é, no canal do YouTube. As pessoas que estão acompanhando pelo canal do YouTube também podem postar as perguntas lá. É uma observação importante... É, a todo, todas as pessoas que queiram ouvir né, a palestra em inglês, nós temos aqui dois canais, né, a, a interpretação pode ser em inglês ou português, basta, é, na barra de ferramentas aqui embaixo, é, na interpretação, escolher o idioma é, que queira ouvir, ou português ou inglês. Fiquem à vontade, doutor Olívia, a palavra é sua, um ótimo painel para nós. Muito obrigado, Rogério. Thank you very much for the to the Union Nacional de Bioenergia for the opportunity to be with you in this 14th National Congress. I have followed your event throughout the years, and it's the first time I'm privileged to participate. So once again, thank you very much for the opportunity. I am blessed with having um, three colleagues, three friends with us today who will seek and strive to give you a comprehensive overview of what we have in front of us and what we can expect leading up to the year 2030. I think that right now the sugar world has been undergoing a massive transition. I think we have learned that there are numerous factors that no matter how good analysts or forecasters we are, you really can't measure in their full breadth. And um, if we were to look back a year or so ago, when the pandemic hit, our supply chains, uh, fortunately, remained solid, but we saw a marked shift in consumption. There was a huge drop in industrial consumption, uh, accompanied by a parallel rise in direct home consumption. But I think that the numbers of the drop 
in sugar sold to companies like Coca-Cola and Nestlé, um, sort of had the forecast of leading to a world where consumption would drop, production would continue, and price levels would reflect this accordingly. Uh, lo and behold, Mother Nature. You know, never underestimate Mother Nature. And um, I think that the efforts that many of us in India, I saw it myself, um, to learn more about the weather, but to learn how to anticipate rather than remediate is going to be key. Uh, nobody expected the degree of drought that has smacked the world. Uh, our two big producers, Brazil and Thailand, were both overwhelmed by conditions that in the case of Brazil, we had not seen for a hundred years. And to top it all off, then on July 19 and 20, we get this freeze, uh, which, you know, sort of sent the ball home, you know. Uh, right now, I think all exporting countries are very, very happy. I know that my colleagues in my region of Central America are, you know, the smile does not fit in their face because the prices are almost, today I just opened it up before starting our event, they're almost hitting 20. And I think that our memory is good enough to remember that we were at levels of 10, 11, 12 shortly some years ago. And this volatility is, as you, like you said at the beginning, Roger, attributed mainly to the situation in Brazil where these two weather phenomena have impacted the production cycle. And to top it all off, there's always the variable of how much cane will you take for ethanol? Uh, with Renova Bio, the program sort of gearing up and gaining some traction, there will be a huge demand for cane. So I think that when you combine all these factors, um, we will probably see a shorter export from Brazil for the next year or so. And I think that the international prices uh, will remain pretty solid. Uh, I think that we should also recognize the efforts that India has been making into diversifying into ethanol and in their exports. I mean, Adir, I've known him for more years than probably I'll care to admit. Uh, we're still young spring chickens, but we have known each other for many, many years. And I have seen the numerous challenges that ISEC has faced, you know, when placing the surplus of Indian production abroad. I think in the past couple of years, you have made tremendous progress. And hopefully there's a platform there to be fine-tuned and improved throughout the years. Um, with Jack Roney, we had been trading stories regarding the impact of sugar. And as I mentioned before, I think in the United States, more than in any other place, one could see the massive increase, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, Jack, it was 32% month after month in home consumption. And you had all these TV people asking, you know, in the US family, well, what is your more happy moment during the pandemic? And they say baking cakes, making cupcakes with the family. So what we are being presented here indirectly is with an incredible opportunity to change the dialogue about sugar. We have so many years of being smacked on the head that we are bad, that we cause every sickness known to man. And now the acceptance of sugar consumption as a result of the home purchase offers a great opportunity for us to influence the debate and, and make it clear to people that enjoying sugar is a good thing. Of course, you don't want to drink 10 Cokes a day or eat, you know, three chocolate cakes in one city, but that, you know, that comes with common sense. It's not about sugar. It's not about carbohydrates. It's just using your head a little bit, you know, to understand what are the best nutritional choices for you. Sugar plays an integral part. We are a carbohydrate that the body needs to have to function. And uh, you can take your choice. You can eat a lot of watermelon like I do in my country and pineapple, or you can put, you know, some good Indian, U.S., Brazilian, or Guatemalan sugar into your coffee. When we look ahead at 2030, and I'm going to turn it over to my panelists because I was looking at the work that they've done, and it's really impressive. We need to conjugate all these factors 
but at the same time resist making rigid predictions. I think that right now with the high prices, everyone is sort of euphoric and the tendencies of God is gonna be so great. I've had friends here who have farms that they lease out to mills and oh, I'm going to keep growing sugar because the price is so good. But once again, a word of caution. Uh, we have many factors as we have seen recently. I don't think anyone in Brazil could have anticipated the impact of the drought coupled with the freeze. Nobody saw it coming and certainly the breadth and the scope of the impact um, is something I think that you're still processing. So without further ado, we're going to start with our panelists. Uh, we agreed with them that first uh, Jack Roney would start. Jack, as uh, Rogerio mentioned, has been a stalwart at the American Sugar Alliance. I have always um, admired and been fascinated by his unique skill in making numbers and charts tell ideas that us normal people can process and digest. Um, I'm not a mathematician par excellence, but when Jack takes numbers and charts and verbalizes them, my degree of comprehension goes way up. So without further ado, Jack, welcome. Thank you for joining us today. Please take it away. Obrigado, Jose. Bom dia to all. Uh, it's wonderful to be with you today. I really appreciate this, uh, this opportunity. Uh, it is an honor to, uh, to be with you. And uh, what I'd like to do is uh, give you uh, some perspective from the United States, uh, a little bit about uh, uh, the U.S. role in the global sugar industry, uh, talk about the production challenges that we all face, uh, the consumption challenges that we all face, and, uh, and what we might uh, work on together. Um, the US sugar industry is the world's fifth biggest uh, producer and uh, the world's third largest consumer and importer. And we're proud of the fact that we are among the lowest cost sugar producing countries in the world. Uh, we are uh, 20th lowest cost of 95 countries and we are particularly proud of that because uh, in the US as a developed country, uh, we face some of the highest labor and environmental standards and costs uh, in the world. So we are uh, highly, highly sustainable uh, and also highly efficient. Our sugar beet growers are among the lowest cost of all uh, sugar beet producers in, in the world. So this map of the US gives you an idea of where sugar is grown and the northern states in gray are sugar beet states, there are 11 of those, and there are three cane states. Uh, sadly, there used to be four cane states, uh, but Hawaii uh, stopped uh, producing sugar in uh, 2016, very sadly. Uh, but we do uh, account for about 142,000 jobs nationwide. Uh, as you look at this chart, the uh, red dots uh, represent sugar beet processing facilities. Uh, those are all cooperatively owned by the growers, uh, which I think is very important. Uh, and our cane operations, the cane mills are in purple uh, in the southern states, and uh, cane refineries are in blue. And uh, most of our uh, sugar cane operations are vertically integrated as well. So we are one of the few countries that produces both beet and cane in significant quantities. And as you can see here, the blue line at the top represents uh, beet sugar production. And we're producing a, about 5 million tons per year of beet sugar, about 4 million tons per year of cane sugar. And those uh, uh, amounts have been uh, uh, increasing uh, modestly uh, over the years. Uh, this, uh, this chart represents about a 30 year period. Now, in terms of overall US, uh, sugar consumption and production. Uh, the red line at the top represents consumption. The blue line at the bottom represents production. And if you look at the uh, at, uh, what uh, Jose Rive was referring to is very correct. Uh, in the U.S., in the first year of the pandemic, uh, and that would be represented here as 2019-20, uh, we had a significant increase uh, in consumption. Uh, almost 2% of that year. And as, uh, as Jose said, um, many people 
uh, were switching their sugar consumption and even increasing it uh, from home baking and, uh, uh, and, and doing a lot of things at home with their families and so on. And so that was a real positive. Uh, since that time though, uh, sugar consumption, this is the current year they were in, uh, has come down a little bit, less than 1%. And USDA is predicting for the coming year, beginning this October 1, uh, that we'll have flat consumption. So we're still kind of waiting to see how this sorts out. But one of the things that we were proud of, and this probably happened in many countries, is that we had to pivot our production uh, from uh, the large bags and, and, and bulk deliveries uh, to food manufacturers and institutions. And we had to switch to uh, producing uh, small bags of sugar to go on grocery store shelves. And we're very proud of the fact that uh, uh, no food manufacturing plants ever had to shut down for lack of sugar. And grocery store shelves were uh, very briefly uh, empty as people hoarded uh, at the very outset of the pandemic, but we very quickly caught up uh, by shifting an enormous uh, amount of our production uh, from bulk deliveries uh, to, uh, to small bags. Uh, our production, as you can see over time, has, has trended up somewhat modestly, but uh, we are uh, prone to the weather, as every country is. And uh, last year, in 2019-20, uh, was when we had a uh, terrible uh, freeze and excess moisture in our beet areas. Uh, and we had uh, some very bad weather in Louisiana, where our cane sugar is produced. So we had a big drop in production uh, last year. Uh, this year, we seem to have rebounded, and we expect to have a pretty decent crop uh, in the year coming forward, but uh, always the, the weather challenges. Uh, focusing in some more on consumption. So this line is, uh, is just U.S. sugar consumption. And what we can see is that uh, during the period from 2002 to about 2013, we had robust growth in consumption. Uh, this was really a positive uh, over 2% per year. Uh, but we've really slowed down since that time, and we're averaging less than one half percent per year. And so this is a concern in the U.S. I know it's a concern in many countries around the world, as, uh, as uh, Jose referred to, sugar is being unjustly attacked. And that is a, a, a problem I'll talk a little bit uh, more about, and that I think is something that uh, gives us a common cause. So... In terms of our sugar production challenges uh, going forward, looking ahead over the next 10 years, uh, we have to defend our production tools. And what we've seen in Europe, I think, is a cautionary tale for all of us, a warning uh, as the uh, really uh, overzealous environmentalists are banning uh, so many of the essential inputs uh, to crop production, not just for sugar, but for other crops. And I think this uh, becomes a real concern. So we've got to uh, really uh, band together and uh, make sure that we can continue to use uh, the type of tools that we need uh, to produce food uh, efficiently. Uh, and we can do this in a sustainable way and in a rational way, but we don't need to put uh, uh, sugar producers and farmers out of business in the process. Uh, we have to defend against domestic policy attacks. In the United States, as I'm sure in many countries, the buyers of sugar are uh, always uh, are frequently lobbying uh, to get sugar prices down. If we manage in our countries to defend a price that is above the world dump market price, uh, we're going to have these kind of attacks. So we have to uh, be ready to, uh, to ward off attacks by uh, the, the buyers of our, of our sugar who are always trying to get our prices down. And uh, a big threat, of course, always is when countries have uh, surpluses and uh, they dump those uh, exports, uh, that sugar onto the world market to solve their problem, uh, which is what leaves us uh, with uh, uh, the dump nature of the world sugar market. I think a really key factor over the next 10 years will be the extent to which uh, sugar producers in surplus countries uh, shift their production uh, of cane to ethanol. Uh, I think this will be a key factor. Of course, Brazil is always a factor in that. And uh, we're watching India. I, I'm very encouraged by, uh, and we'll hear from Adira in a minute, uh, I'm very encouraged by India's plans to, uh, to convert about 6 million tons 
as I understand it, of their sugar surplus uh, to ethanol. Uh, this would be a tremendous positive uh, for the world sugar market uh, uh, when that does occur. Now, in the United States, when we try to explain why we have a sugar policy and why we try to defend a domestic price that's higher than the world milk market price, uh, one of the ways that I explain that is to try to help people understand uh, the dump nature of the world sugar market. So what this line represents is the world average cost of producing sugar in cents per pound uh, from LMC International. I think this is widely accepted as uh, a, a, a very uh, reliable measure of the total economic cost of producing sugar. Uh, so from low points in the early 2000s, around 13 cents per pound, uh, most recent year that LMC has provided data uh, shows a uh, cost of about 23 cents per pound. Now, what I tell my audiences in the United States is, now imagine what the world sugar price would look like if we superimpose that here. And the expectation would be that they would think, well, the price must be at or above the cost of production. And that's how we get to have a world sugar industry. But of course, the reality, as we know, uh, is, is far different from that. Uh, so this red line is the uh, number 11 uh, raw contract price. Uh, over time, we're looking over uh, more than a 30 year period. And what we see is that the world average cost of producing sugar over these 30 years average 19 cents per pound, but the world price averaged only 13 cents per pound. And people look at this, they scratch their heads and say, well, how could we actually have a world sugar industry if the price is so far below the cost of producing sugar? And the answer is that, uh, as we know, only about probably about 20, 25% of the world's uh, raw sugar is sold at this, at this price. And the rest is, sold, is either sold domestically uh, at a much higher price uh, or it is sold at preferential prices uh, by uh, in, in arrangements with some importing countries. And as Jose referred to, you know, the volatility of the world sugar market has been tremendous. Uh, you know, just uh, a few months in the pandemic, we, we dipped down to uh, nine cents per pound. And now, uh, so as Jose mentioned, uh, we're, uh, we're flirting with uh, 20 cents per pound. And that kind of volatility is just uh, very hard for producers to deal with and to make, uh, make decisions on. Uh, so that's we why we have domestic policies that sustain a more stable uh, price in country. Now, turning to the sugar consumption side, uh, and again, Jose previewed my presentation very well on talking about a misguided attacks on sugar. And one of the most pernicious in the US is this notion that, uh, uh, that we, the Americans are more obese uh, because they're eating more sugar. And I'm going, we'll take a look, closer look at that in a minute. And as a result, we see federal guidelines that are trying to inspire food manufacturers to uh, make the same sweet appealing products, but with less sugar. Uh, and that's very difficult to do uh, without resorting to uh, artificial chemicals uh, to, to sweeten, uh, sweeten the products. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the, the US experience in terms of what's happening with uh, sugar consumption here and uh, what's happening with uh, our obesity rates. So here in terms of per capita sugar consumption, that's sugar consumption per person uh, per year. And, and what we see is that uh, back in the 70s, uh, we saw a drop in sugar production because uh, high fructose corn syrup became available. It was cheaper than sugar. And beverage manufacturers in the US during the uh, 70s and 80s uh, converted their beverage industries to high fructose corn syrup. So that continued for some time. And around the early 2000s, there were about equal amounts of sugar and uh, HFCS uh, consumption. Uh, but since that time, uh, consumers have become less enamored of high fructose corn syrup, uh, concerned about the health effects. Uh, they're consuming a lot less, a lot fewer uh, caloric beverages, uh, sodas, and, and the like. And they've been uh, kind of moving back toward all natural sugar. So uh, that has been a plus for us. And uh, you can see over the last couple of years, the concern, our per capita consumption came down somewhat in 2018 and 2019. Uh, 2020 was up a bit. Uh, that seemed to be the COVID effect. Uh, and we're not sure where this is gonna go from here. Now, this uh, chart shows 
total per capita sweetener consumption. So that's sugar plus HFCS and some other sweeteners. And what we can see here is that the total core sweetener consumption peaked uh, around the turn of the century, uh, but has been coming down uh, steadily uh, ever since by about 20%. Uh, and this is mainly because of declining HFCS consumption. And I think in, in the US, uh, what we're seeing is a, uh, people are more and more going to bottled water uh, rather than to bottled soft drinks. And so that's been a big factor. So you would think with this drop in, in sweetener consumption, gee, we must be getting thinner in the United States, uh, but we're not. Unfortunately, uh, the rates of obesity uh, have continued to, uh, to rise over time. So uh, what this represents is since 1974, um, as a, the index is 100%, how much has child obesity increased? Uh, that's the red line. It's about quadrupled. Adult obesity has about tripled over time. And uh, this is something that is a genuine, uh, it's a pandemic in the United States. Uh, it's a tremendous cause for concern. And I don't mean to uh, to, uh, to trivialize it by any means. But uh, there is a temptation uh, for people to say, oh, it's because we're consuming more sugar. Well, what has sugar consumption done? Well, as I've shown you, uh, our sugar consumption is down over time. And then if we uh, compare with total caloric sweetener consumption, even there, if we just looked uh, you know, beginning around the year uh, 1999, you can see sweetener consumption is down about 20% on a per capita basis, uh, but uh, obesity continues to rise. So it's really not fair by any means uh, to blame uh, sugar uh, for rising obesity. And this is probably you know, a, a debate uh, that, uh, that people are having in sugar producing countries around the world. So just to look a little more closely at this problem in the United States, uh, what this pie chart represents is total caloric consumption. That's all foods. Uh, on, a, uh, on a daily basis. And Americans were consuming in 1970 uh, about 2,000 calories per day. And about 16% of that uh, was added sugar and sweeteners. Now, fast forward to more recent year, the more, most recent year that we have available is 2014. And what we see here is a bigger pie because our total caloric, sweet, uh, our total caloric consumption has gone up uh, by uh, almost 400 calories per day. Uh, so we are uh, consuming about 20% more, more food uh, per day, uh, but we are almost certainly exercising less. And uh, I think you know, that is, rather than trying to single out one particular food, I think that that's the, the problem in the United States is that we're eating more and uh, almost certainly exercising less. Meanwhile, the sweetener share of our consumption has not gone up, it's gone down from 16% to 15%. So this looks at the individual food groups and we can see that uh, what Americans have been doing is consuming a lot more prepared foods that are heavy in grains, uh, fats and oils, and uh, less sugar and uh, less fruits and vegetables, unfortunately. Uh, and what this shows is the share of uh, of our U.S. caloric consumption uh, that is accounted for by sweeteners down from 16.5% to 15.3%. So to put it mildly, the data do not support sugar and sweeteners as the primary driver of obesity in the United States, and I'm sure that it's the same in other countries. So um, we, we, I am with the American Sugar Alliance. We represent all the uh, uh, beet and cane producers and processors uh, on domestic and trade policy issues. Uh, we have a sister group called the Sugar Association and uh, they are led by uh, Dr. Uh, Courtney Gain, uh, who is a brilliant scientist and uh, also a, a fairly famous uh, American athlete. She brings a lot of credibility uh, to our message. And, uh, <clears throat> and we are very uh, happy to have the Sugar Association <clears throat> to, uh, to work with on these sugar consumption challenges. And I'm sure uh, those of you who <clears throat> have uh, met uh, Dr. Gain or uh, in contact uh, with her uh, recognize the, uh, the resources that the Sugar Association has. And uh, we would welcome your uh, contacting them for, for uh, any help that 
or cooperation that we might be able to do. So uh, in uh, perspective from the United States, uh, just to kind of talk about uh, the global challenges that we all face, uh, it would be uh, defending uh, our policies and our industries <clears throat> against uh, foreign dumping and against attacks on our production tools. Uh, and, but uh, we can do that in a sustainable fashion and we must uh, defend sure consumption against the illegitimate attacks. And that's something I think we can all work on together. And Jose Rive and the International Sure Organization uh, provide a tremendous platform for that kind of cooperation. So I will close now and mention to you uh, that in two weeks, I will be closing out my 47 year career in agricultural policy in Washington. And uh, it's been a tremendous uh, uh, pleasure to uh, to work with uh, and for American farmers over that time. Uh, this is the, the last international group that I will be uh, addressing and I'm honored to be with you. And I want to let you know that my successor uh, is, uh, is Rob Johansson, Dr. Rob Johansson is the immediate past chief economist of the U.S. Department of Agriculture. He's a brilliant guy uh, with a tremendous reputation uh, throughout the industry. And uh, as of September 1, he will be stepping up to, uh, to my role as director of economics and policy analysis. So uh, thank you for allowing me to be with you on this, my, uh, my last major international address. And it's an honor to be on this panel and to, uh, to be with you today. Thank you very much, Jack. Um, you will be sorely missed um, and we wish you success in your retirement. Uh, we will shift gears because I understand that you are a lover of hockey, but Rob <laughs> likes football. So when he comes over to England, I think we'll relate to him and certainly in Brazil, I think they will talk the same language if it's football. Jack, one quick uh, point and, and, and your take on this. I mean, the evidence, as you correctly pointed out, is overwhelming in the sense that obesity rates are climbing, climbing, and sugar consumption is going down. Uh, the chart that you showed in the States, we have tracked at ISO for the UK, we have tracked it for Australia. I mean, it's pretty much the country because there is no single example of the obesity rates going parallel with the climb in sugar. Why do all these groups like Action in Sugar and the UK and others in the US, uh, our good friend Rock, Robert Lustig, get away with blaming sugar so blatantly and with such ease about all these obesity problems when the data is, is so clear that it shows it's not there? What, what would you say there in terms yeah, of it's a, That's a great question, Jose, and it is a tremendous frustration and it amazes me that scientists would uh, look at the data and mm -hmm. say, uh, oh, uh, I think I figured it out, it's sugar. Uh, I remember one time Lustig, uh, uh, Professor Lustig saying uh, in, in, with horror that global sugar consumption uh, had to double, doubled in the last 50 years. Well, I think the global population had tripled <laughs> over that time. Uh, so there's just uh, disconnects there. So I think the answer is that uh, people are looking for easy solutions. They're looking for uh, villains, uh, easy answers, uh, and they're willing to stigmatize one particular group. Uh, mm -hmm. Instinctively, people just think, uh, uh, you know, sugar is bad for you. Uh, uh, sweetened products are bad for you. And, and the alternative is to take responsibility for our eating more and exercising less. Uh, you know, I think... But, you know, to me, it seems like a, as a fairly simple solution rather than these crazy fad diets uh, that if we just tried to uh, consume a little less each day and exercise more, we would be in much better shape as a population. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, sugar right now seems to be in the crosshairs. I remember around the year 2000 that fats were in the crosshairs, and that was when sugar consumption mm -hmm. began going up again because uh, product manufacturers were replacing fats in their products with sugar. And that was when we had, uh, you know, began a nice long uh, consumption uh, growth uh, trend. Uh, but um, I'm hoping that sugar will not remain in the crosshairs much longer, but this is something all of us, all of our countries, I think need to work on uh, to make it clear that sugar consumption in moderation is healthy. It's a, it's a very simple message 
but sometimes a hard one to get across. And it forms part of a healthy nutrition, of a healthy diet when consumed at the appropriate levels. I think, you know, that this whole issue emphasizes the importance for us to message and communicate singing off the same hymn sheet. Um, I think part of the problem we face today is that many countries, sugar producers, did what is commonly known as the ostrich trick. You know, they saw the criticism coming. They figured, I'll bury my head in the sand, and when I take it out and, take, you know, shake off the dust, the problem will have gone away. Well, guess what? It got worse because this perpetuation of half-truths about sugar and obesity and sugar and carries was repeated so many times, especially in social media, that it has totally thrown people's head off balance. Um, I, I tell the story, and Jonathan Kingsman picked it up in his book, The Sugar Casino, that it was going around with my niece, who's a lawyer, graduated for Stanford, so she's not stupid. And we're going around a supermarket, and Oh, no, 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 that cereal, that's got too much sugar. But in went the pineapple and the tomato and the watermelon and everything. And I said, well, I thought you said no sugar. Oh, no, no, that sugar is different. And you're like, uh-huh, okay. And you explained that one to me. But what I'm trying to illustrate is the distortion that it has created in consumer habits and in people's perception about our product because of this constant unchallenged barrage of people like Robert Lustig. So I think I'll pick up, you know, Jack's call to arms and encourage everyone watching here um, to do their part, to speak out about sugar and, and to just say the truth, you know, because if we remain quiet, the monopoly of a narrow-minded debate will continue to impact us and it will be reflected in people's attitude to our product. You know, it's just very simple on that. You know, well, thank you very much, Jack. Uh, we will now proceed with my friend Adir Ja. Uh, Adir, as I said, has been in the sugar world for many, many years. He has seen many, many chapters of the evolution of sugar throughout the years, and certainly the situation in India and the key role that ESEC plays has required that him and his team constantly be on their toes to react, you know, to change, to look, uh, think outside the box. Um, so we're very pleased to have Adir with us and give us his take on India. Adir, the floor is yours. Welcome. Thank you, Dr. Adive, for your kind words. Uh, I shall start by thanking the UW team, especially uh, Rogerio and uh, his team, for giving me an opportunity to bring the India story to the audience today. To start with, if I were to have carried out a similar exercise in the year 2010. Probably, I doubt if my perspective it, uh, would really match with what we have achieved in the last decade. The last decade really has been positive for the Indian sugar sector. And if we look at the position that we are in today, I mean, this is the current season that is going on. It ends on September the 30th. We have a net sugar production of 31 million tons. We are reaching our export sugar export target of 7 million tons. Besides, I think we've made taken great strides in the ethanol production where we are almost uh, reaching 4 billion lit uh, liters. If I were to have been asked this question in 2010, which were my initial years with the sugar sector in India, I probably would have laugh this away saying that this is not possible. To add to this, during this period, uh, 2010 to 2020, we have not really seen what we used to talk about of the famous Indian sugar cycle. This has not happened overnight. Obviously, this has taken a lot of time. We were looking at a sugar policy which was more industry friendly. I myself was part of the easing of controls on the sugar side that happened in uh, April of uh, 2013. We did away with what uh, we used to call the, the levy system, which was the procurement of sugar for the Indian uh, public distribution system. We also did away with the release mechanism that was in place uh, before that. Of course, uh, in the coming years, the release mechanism was brought back in a 
different form. And most importantly, in 2018, the government in its wisdom, because they were fixing the sugarcane prices, thought of the minimum supply price for sugar, which was brought in. And it, this was a big help to the sugar mills in uh, taking care of their uh, sugarcane price areas. What we have seen in the last decade was a varietal improvement in sugarcane, especially in the north uh, of the country. This variety C028 has brought a revolution. And from a, an average of about 7 million tons that we were seeing uh, the state of Uttar Pradesh producing, they are now almost at 12 million tons. And mind you, this is net of the diversion to ethanol. The Ethanol bending program got a great boost since 2014. There was a more focused approach both by the government and industry towards the ethanol program. And this again, as we have been discussing earlier, has really uh, set a new trend in the Indian sugar industry. If we look at this uh, chart here, I must apologize, I have used uh, lakh tons for those of you who are not familiar with our nomenclature. One lakh is roughly one tenth, is exactly one tenth of a million. So it's 100,000 tons. So the sugar production in India, if you will see, in the first half of the, dec of the last decade was roughly around 26 uh, million tons. And this, in the second half of the last decade, has moved up to over 30 million tons. Accordingly, exports uh, have taken place. Of course, we did have an exception in the year 2016, 17. We had a very low crop of about 20 million tons. But we have been a regular exporter for most of the last decade. And in the last three years, especially, we have outdone our performance in the earlier years. How has the uh, government been managing its stocks? Now, while being part of the government, we were looking at three months uh, stock to uh, look after our requirements from the months of uh, September to November before the new crop comes in. So we, I, I would say that policymakers are happy to have at least three months of production uh, or three months of consumption available with them uh, at the end of the season to tide over that period. But look at 2016-17, even with a sub 4 million figure, we were able to handle that situation. And I think we came out with flying colors. The years thereafter have uh, seen our stock levels actually going up to almost 15 million tons. And that has been a struggle here in India. And therefore, we have been uh, aggressively pushing for exports and trying to get rid of the surplus because ultimately it hits my cane farmers who have a lot uh, of areas building up. And that is neither politically nor economically uh, feasible for us to carry on with. If we were to look at the sugarcane production, I think most of our 80% of our production comes from the three states in the north Uttar Pradesh, which uh, probably supplies 40% of uh, the total sugar produced in the country. And 50% comes from the two states of Maharashtra and Karnataka. And if we look at the last decade, most of the swings have happened when due to weather issues, Maharashtra and Karnataka have seen a dip in production. Ethanol production is something that has really taken off now. We started with our program in 2007. And uh, if you look at this chart, you will see that the first half of the last decade, we were struggling to really get it on stream. And it has really picked up in the second half. Of course, with 2016-17, we see a dip there. That was, again, was a poor year for uh, sugarcane production because of uh, drought in the southern part of the country. But I, I believe that we are now looking at higher levels of production. So what is the outlook for the next season before we start looking at 2030? Preliminary estimates show that sugar production net of diversion to ethanol would be close to 31 million tons. We expect the sugar production, uh, the sugar export to continue, especially with the fair prices that we are seeing in the world market today, that India should be able to repeat its export of about five to six million tons, if not more. 
And the best part is that the diversion to ethanol will be almost 3 million tons of sugar equ equivalent, if not more. So what is the road ahead? If, we're, if one were to analyze the sugar situation in India, what has happened is that the sugar cane acreage has roughly been between 5.25 to 5.5 million hectares. This figure goes down in the drought years and uh, has gone down to almost 4 million uh, hectares. But on the other side, we don't expect this to be moving up higher because we have a lot of competition from other crops, which uh, is required for such a large population uh, like ours. So my assumption is that we will be range bound. It will be between five to five and a half million hectares at best. And a lot of the actual acreage will be affected by weather conditions, especially in the peninsular or the southern part of the country. As far as the productivity is concerned, we have seen an upward trend, especially in the northern states uh, in the past decade. But peninsular India has seen their productivity going down. We have a lot of the sugar protein breeding institutes at work. They are looking at uh, better varieties, the drought resistant varieties. So this is an area where we feel that there is co tremendous scope for improvement, but the results have been by, by far very slow and not to our expectations. If you look at recovery, we have had almost a 10% increase over the last decade. I mean, from an all India average of about 10 to 2.2%, we are looking at figures of 11.08% in uh, the current year. But here again, we have seen that the recovery improvement has mainly been in uh, North India, not across the country. So we are looking at new varieties. Now, any variety that is has to be developed probably takes 10 to 12 years. In peninsular India, we have two new varieties under trials. One is the CO09004 and CO11015. In North India, we have another variety under trials, the CO15023, which may work alongside CO0238 and probably in the years to come may also uh, replace it. The focus obviously is on drought resistant um, varieties because of uh, the vagaries that we have with the rains. And this is an important aspect that really needs to be looked at. And this is what we are striving for. Having been in the export market in a big way in the last three years, exports is something that we really need to look uh, at. This of course will be a function of what domestic price we'll be able to get because being large, the largest consumers of sugar in the world, 85% of our production is likely to be taken up by our own uh, domestic consumption. Since we have made uh, tremendous uh, investments into ethanol, ethanol will be a priority for the country, but the ethanol and the sugar price parity is likely to pay, uh, play a major role in how much of the surplus uh, sugar we are able to export. We also feel that given the current prices of sugar, mills might be uh, tempted to sacrifice the ethanol for sugar, and especially if the international prices gives them, uh, gets them a good return. The ethanol program for se, which was discussed in uh, another of these uh, meetings where my friend Abhinash had participated, is something where we can uh, really see that the blending levels seem to have uh, gone up over the years. The prime minister has himself targeted 20% uh, target to be reached by 2025 which will mean there's a total requirement of only of almost 13.5 billion liters in the country, of which a little more than half is to be made available from uh, molasses based uh, ethanol and that means from the sugarcane crop. So what are the key takeaways uh, that we, are, we can look at? In my opinion, sugar production, net of ethanol production will settle at 
definitely around 30, 30 million tons. This will become the new normal. Our ethanol program is there to stay. We expect four to five million tons of sugar equivalent to be converted to ethanol every year. Weather permitting, India will continue to be in the export market. Though, of course, the quantities would be lower because the diversion to ethanol will reduce our uh, sugar surplus. And we will unfortunately continue to be dependent on the weather conditions and the variations in production will be there. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Avir, uh, for this very comprehensive presentation. Um, you mentioned um, the quest for better productivity, better yields, better performance, um, and some of the varieties that India has been exploring. Um, are you, like other countries, looking at varieties that will produce more sucrose with less sunlight and more humidity? Is that more or less the trend that you're looking at in terms of something that can endure and produce in India? As I mentioned, that is the focus. We are looking at drought-resistant varieties, which means that even with uh, a lower moisture, they can be sustained. Sunlight is not a problem here, but we do have the years when the monsoon fails and then uh, the water storage also gets depleted in the southern states because they are to a large extent dependent on tank irrigation, which means that they need to have water in the tanks. And unfortunately, since sugarcane is the best paying crop, uh, there is no rational use of the water and if the water is available, it gets diverted to the sugarcane crop at the cost of other crops and also human consumption. So then you have a couple of years where the water availability in the peninsular regions is really uh, very precarious. Not so much for the north part. So that is why we have been able to manage with our own, uh, you can say the surplus that we've carried over and the production in the northern states. But this, this, this uh, definitely, I mean, the uh, consensus here is that we are looking at drought resistant varieties to try and average out or even improve on the uh, productivity as well as the recovery in the peninsula states. Thank you, Adi. Um, another uh, area I think of interest right now is the efforts that India has undertaken to increase their exports, and you showed it in your in your charts. Uh, recently at ISO, we have been receiving a lot of complaints from uh, exporting countries like yours because the freights have gone way up. Uh, shipping freights. Has this something that has impacted ESEC and India recently? I mean, as you are trying to strengthen and bolster your exports, you are faced with these, you know, freight rates that in some cases from some countries have turned to be ridiculous, you know. Are you facing that same challenge? Uh, let me first uh, make it clear that for India, exports is not a matter of choice. It's a compulsion. As I said, that given the nature of our farmers, the, most of them have very small holdings, we need to ensure that the sugar is sold quickly so that the areas don't uh, develop over the period of time. It's not also politically prudent to allow the areas to build up. But having said that, yes, see, in the last couple of years, we have uh, a new market in Indonesia because of the failure of the Thai crop. We expect that to change a little this year because Thailand may come back with a better crop. And as you rightly mentioned, freight rates means that obviously Thailand is better placed than India as far as Indonesia is concerned. But what also happens is that because of the poorer crop from Brazil and the higher freight rates, a lot of the Brazilian markets will autom automatically become more attractive for the Indian sugar. If one were to really uh, point out probably uh, Bangladesh is a market which will now look mm -hmm. to India for its uh, sugar export. Here the freight rates will make a tremendous difference. We are not sure uh, if the Al Khalij refinery is also looking at uh, Indian sugar that is Dubai. So these, these are markets which probably uh, will uh, open up for India because of the higher freight rates. And uh, otherwise uh, 
if you are looking at us uh, as a challenge if you are looking at uh, the cost i think we are better placed than brazil and it will be probably be the lower brazilian crop that india would be replacing in at least in the coming season and uh, regarding ethanol avir i think that you have made tremendous progress and certainly the targets set out are very ambitious um, how is it working inside india do is there a blending mandate is this done by the central government do states like uttar pradesh and maharashtra and karnataka have the power to establish their own mandates of mixing how is that working these days hey, this is more or less at a national level where the targets are definitely higher we still are short of uh, the required amounts of ethanol so what what the what, what does happen is that in the producing states that is karnataka maharashtra and uttar pradesh probably we have already reached the 10% blend levels and our vehicles probably can take up to 12% so 10% mandate uh, is possible across these states some of the neighboring states also have 10% the distant states are probably at lower levels so at an, a national level we are averaging 8% and i must admit that at this stage uh, we don't have the production to meet anything more than 8% but a lot of capacity is being built they'll come on stream probably in the next year or two and by that time we would be in a position to meet higher levels of blending and what we've also done is that we are also allowed a grain based ethanol to be produced so that will be spread out in the non sugar cane uh, belt which will allow us access to ethanol uh, in a more fair manner across the whole country so then probably what happens is that uh, you're not dependent on sugar cane alone so uh, you will have uh, both uh, you can say the uh, food based ethanol as well as the sugar cane based ethanol so that 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 probably will allow us to reach the higher levels much faster um we have a question uh, for you adir uh, from the audience and um they ask could good sugar prices hinder expansion plans for indian ethanol yes that is something that we are uh, really concerned about because unless you see roughly we are looking at a uh, 1.6 is the ratio i mean if uh, sugar sells at 30 then probably uh, what I, i need an ethanol price of 48 so in case sugar prices go up there could be a tendency amongst the mills to stop producing ethanol and convert to sugar but the flip side here is that where do they uh, sell this sugar the requirement is only as much so you have the choice of between and with the release mechanism that we have in place you either convert to ethanol and uh, reduce your sugar or if you make more sugar you must uh, carry it for a longer period so yes there will be a challenge here but then uh, unless there is too much of a variation between the sugar and ethanol prices i think uh, mills would be well advised to continue with their ethanol production to and ensure that sugar production is kept at levels where the prices can be sustained Thank you very much, Adir. Very direct, very comprehensive uh, responses um, and a good presentation that gives us a clear vision of where India is headed for 2030. We will now uh, proceed with our third speaker. Uh, Marcelo Mancini Stella is the Vice President for Commercialization of Ethanol, Sugar and, en and Energy, Planning and Logistics at Atbos. He's been there since 2010. Prior to that, He was with Braskem, so he is very familiar with all diversification byproducts that um, come from sugar cane. Uh, he holds a BS in production engineering and a master's degree, an MBA from the University of Sao Paulo. Marcelo, welcome. Tell us about Brazil. Thank you, Mr. Olive. Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. First, I'd like to thank Amaury, Salib, and Rogério for the invitation to be here. It's a pleasure and an honor. I will share my, my screen with you in just a sec. Okay. So, 
in order to to address the vision of sugar market in 2030 how you approach how sugar supply side and sugar demand side should behave for the next 10 years the supply side will be impacted by the transition to low carbon economy that is already underway as ethanol and sugar made from sugar cane uh, dispute the same raw material changes in ethanol consumption will affect the supply of sugar and we believe ethanol will play two roles during this transition one is a energetic transition fuel from now to the consolidation of electric vehicles and a whole of an important player in the generation of power to electric vehicles as a transition fuel we foresee a consistent growth of ethanol consumption driven by higher blendings around the world to reduce emissions during the journey to the electric vehicle but i would like to focus in two programs uh, with a more detailed view that will show how we expect the growth in ethanol consumption the first one is the the brazilian renewable program established to meet COP21 emissions reduction targets. The Nova Bill, that is on the second year, will expand the consumption of ethanol from 29 million cubics in 2020 to 47 million cubics in 2029. So just looking at, at the Brazilian consumption without considering the expansion of the blendings around the world, we, we, we expect this growth in ethanol consumption. The second is the India ethanol blending program, which is an ethanol blending <coughs> initiative to reach 20% of blending. Uh, this program developed by, by, by the government started in 2010 and has achieved important results. The current forecast for E20 is to increase the ethanol consumption in India by 7 million cubics until 2025. Now, putting a look to the future, it's unquestionable that mobility will rely on electric vehicles. They are more efficient, they do not emit, and so on and so on. By 2030, estimations of IEA indicate sales of 20 million electric vehicles, or 30% of sales share. Every car maker around the world has its own development program towards electric vehicles. Scenarios for 2050 show a huge growth of the participation of electricity in transportation metrics. And this brings along a huge challenge to generate this amount of energy in a clean way. It will not be enough to reduce vehicles emissions. The world will have to reduce emissions in power generation as well. We may focus on three routes to the electric vehicles. The first is the electric plug-in vehicles with batteries and the challenges of production and disposal of these batteries and the generation of clean energy. The second route, hydrogen fuel cells, and the challenges of storing and transporting hydrogen. 
And the third one, which is the ethanol, ethanol fuel cells, uh, which has many, many, uh, many advantages against the, the hydrogen cells and the electric vehicles. We have, through this ethanol fuel cell, we have the lowest CO2 emissions. We have no battery disposal challenges. It's much safer and more friendly than hydrogen fuel to be transported and stored. And we can use a refueling infrastructure already available to, to, to fill the, the ethanol to, into the cars and then inside the car, transform ethanol in hydrogen and hydrogen in electricity. So those advantages may, may put ethanol in a strong position for electric vehicles in the future. So we, we, we would have ethanol as a transition fuel, and then we could have ethanol as a main player uh, for the electric vehicles without using batteries, generating electricity from the, the ethanol. Now, I'd like to move to the demand side of sugar. Uh, the, the growth of sugar demand for the next 10 years should be similar uh, of the pattern we have currently. This chart is well known by the audience and shows as eating habits vary according to the income level of the nations. <laughs> and sugar consumption is affected by those habits. And as we can see, there is a huge potential coming from Africa, India, Latin America, and East Europe. We know very well that developed countries seek to reduce sugar consumption, as Jack pointed very well, uh, to reduce sugar consumption in food and beverage. But uh, on the other hand, we can see a strong trend among young people to consume natural products against artificial ones, which should favor the consumption of sugar. As Mr. Olivi mentioned, this, this pandemic experience, cooking at home using sugar, can, can bring some more, how can I say, some more goodwill for, for sugar. But we foresee a reduction in, in sugar per capita consumption in developed countries. As we also know, in developing countries, the per capita consumption of sugar grows and should continue growing until 2030. So when we put this together, the, the net growth will add a demand of 28 million tons by 2030, reaching a total global demand of 200 and 13 million tons. So we can foresee a, an important increase in the consumption of sugar. And I would like to move back to finish my presentation. I would like to move back to Brazil and India ethanol problem. On the, Brazil, on the Brazilian side, ethanol consumption will increase 18 million cubics until 2029. And this will require 25% more total recoverable sugar or 22 million ERS. On, on India side, until 2025, the consumption of ethanol should increase by 7 million cubic meters. And this would require 33% more TRF, TRS or 12 million tons of TRS. 
So we foresee a tight global supply and demand for sugar in the coming years. Thank you. Muito obrigado. Thank you very much, Marcelo, for Thank that you. presentation. Yeah, I was particularly intrigued by your curve, you know, with the growth in consumption, because at ISO uh, during the 90s and certainly the early 2000s, we were used, and, and Jack mentioned this before, at tracking increase in consumption with demographics. And the whole debate was it always was above 2%. Now, as we see in your average, we're at 1.7. So um, the demographic growth is still there, but the consumption of sugar has disengaged itself a bit. And I don't think um, that we can preclude that that is due to the war on sugar. The perception created mainly amongst young people that eating our product is bad for you. You know, it's just a very telling graphic there. Uh, Marcelo, we have a question from the audience, um, and it reads, uh, many countries are including ethanol from sugarcane in their energy matrix to reduce carbon emissions. Does that mean a more strong correlation between oil and sugarcane prices for the future? Yes, I think that probably we will have uh, an effect of the the crude oil prices, the energy prices, uh, and the sugar prices. I, uh, I think so. I think that nowadays we already have some relationship between the, this commodity and, and sugar price, but I think it will increase with this, with this participation of ethanol in the energy market. Thank you. Another question, Marcelo, a little bit to the side of the topics that you mentioned. Uh, there's been a lot of talk recently about the key importance for Brazil to improve its export port infrastructure. Uh, you hear all the time that Santos is overloaded, that a second big port, that this. Are there any plans in Brazil to develop a, a shipping facility that can streamline and, and make more agile uh, the dispatch of sugar for, for export in Brazil. This, is, this has been a challenge for, for Brazil for the last, let's say, 20 years. Uh, I, think, I think our, our Minister of Infrastructure has been working on that. We have some projects in north northeast of of the country to to develop new new facilities to export and also to develop infrastructure road and and railroad infrastructure to reach those ports so we we expect to to reduce costs and to gain productivity in exports in the coming years. That's great. Um, another point that I wanted to make, and I don't know if you can give us an update on how is the uh, CTC and my friend Gustavo Lechis and his team's plans to uh, market and, and have people understand and appreciate a genetically modified cane. Has that moved forward? Well, uh, They've been doing a very good job with GMO sugarcane. Uh, we know they've they've been working to to promote it, to to put it in a in a in a right view for people around the world. And uh, I do not have detailed plans how they are planning to to improve the. The, commu the communication, the development of the GMO term. No, I think they have their work cut out for them because, uh, I mean, we've discussed this over the years. It's incredible from the ISO's point of view to see the, the contrasting disparities in the perception of people vis-a-vis -vis GMO. I mean, in Europe, it is like you are talking about Satan. You know, and, and in the UK, we, of course, have 
His Excellency Prince Charles, who is very vocal about what he calls Frankenfood. Uh, whereas in the Brazil is already being worked, Colombia has worked it. I think the Roundup Ready and the programs with beet seed in the United States speak for themselves. The results are there. I don't see any massive amounts of bees being killed as a result of this, as was alleged when the, the development of this technology came about. So I think, you know, that we have to, to take this into consideration and, and also improve our messages. One more question for you, uh, Marcel. In the Atmos group, what is the production mix between sugar and ethanol? Some people think that we have complete autonomy in choosing one product over another, but it's not like that, right? Right. Well, Atmos is not exactly the average of, of this, the, the, the mix of the production. We have 80% ethanol, 10% sugar, and 10% energy from, from the bagasse. And we can move, I would say, we can go to 75 to 25 ethanol and sugar or 80 to 20, because we, we have only two facilities producing sugar. And we have okay. total eight facilities, six producing just ethanol and two producing both. What do you think, Marcelo, will be the effect of the recent changes with BioSev, with other companies in Brazil, with the, the, the advances of Raizen? Will there be a change in the makeup of ethanol production? Is second generation going to gain traction? How do you see that coming about for the year 2000, 2030? Good. Well, I think this, this consolidation in the industry, mm -hmm. it had a period where it was very active, then at the beginning of 2010, the, this, this kind of, of movement decreased. Now I think we can be facing a new, a new wave of consolidation. I think it's good for the market. I think if we have scale, if we have best class management and R&D focus, and so it's good for the sector. I think the second generation ethanol is something uh, everybody's trying to put on a string in a scalable way. The US, Brazil, and Europe, I think uh, if all those, all, all those forecasts that come from this transition to low carbon economy, if, if this happens, and I believe it will, I think ethanol 2G will have a new, a new wave of investments and researches. And I think we could see in a few years, the amount of ethanol 2G growing a lot on the supply of ethanol in a global way. Thank you, Marcelo. Uh, I'm going to open up the floor to all of our uh, speakers because I'm receiving some questions uh, addressed uh, to Jack, to Adir, and of course to Marcelo. Uh, the first one is to Adir, and uh, it comes from René Sordi. What fate will be given to Vinas if ethanol production in India increases? <laughs> What do you mean by Vinas? Is that Bagas? Yeah, I am reading it to you textually. It says, what fate will be given to Vinas if ethanol production in India increases? So I, I would imagine, what do you do with the Vinas that comes out of the process of the production? I mean, uh, we do Somebody, have, somebody uh, says now, uh, I believe it's spent wash, sir. Okay, spent wash. See, we have we have gone into the incineration process. So mm -hmm. we are uh, incinerating the spent wash and trying to extract some uh, fertilizers from there, which has been allowed. So it would depend on each uh, sugar mill to decide on what uh, 
form they want to uh, look at that but most of them are going for incinerators so the spent posh will have to be uh, incinerated and then they are getting uh, some of them are looking at phosphorus others are looking at potash so that has become an important source uh, of uh, fertilizers really Thank you, Adi. We have a question for Jack. Um, it says, some countries have adopted public policies to reduce sugar consumption and even surcharge sugar. Can we fear lawsuits against sugar similar to what happened in recent decades with the tobacco industry? Well, That's certainly a concern because of the hysterical and uninformed reaction of some people uh, to sugar consumption. And we have seen localities, uh, cities, counties, um, I don't believe any states that have imposed uh, sugar taxes, but we've also seen uh, where voters uh, have the opportunity to vote on that. Uh, we've seen opposition mm -hmm. to sugar taxes with the uh, arguments that um, in, in impinges on personal freedom, but also the argument that there's no evidence to show that um, reducing soft drink consumption, which is generally what these are aimed at, uh, helps the public health. Uh, there's been no connection. So these sugar taxes are often, uh, uh, they often admit that the real purpose of the sugar tax is to raise revenue. Certainly we're watching what happens in Mexico where they've been pretty aggressive with sugar taxes and uh, with uh, uh, front of the package warning labels we're seeing some reduction in sugar consumption in Mexico. I know our Mexican friends are very concerned about that, but we haven't seen any evidence of any great improvement in public health. We haven't seen any evidence of uh, reduction in obesity. So <clears throat> certainly there are people who are uh, fairly hysterical about uh, the role of sugar, uh, but if they were to begin to bring lawsuits, I think they would quickly find that there was no science to base those on, uh, that there's no scientific connection uh, between uh, uh, sugar consumption and, uh, and uh, obesity or other uh, health concerns, uh, nor is there any evidence that reducing sugar consumption, which is what we've been having for the last 20 years in, in the United States, is helpful to public health. So uh, yes, it is a concern. Yes, we must be vigilant, um, but I don't think that uh, uh, threats like the, uh, the, the tobacco route uh, uh, would really uh, be able to uh, to have much uh, substance or much success. I think it's important that you touched upon the point of sugar taxes. Um, we track that closely at ISO. And <clears throat> firstly, we noticed <laughs> that the countries that first implemented it, the Scandinavians, Norway, Denmark, got rid of it precisely because it did not accomplish any improvement in the overall health of their population. Lately, we have seen a proliferation of these sugar taxes, and um, I'm going to be careful in how I say this, but it's becoming increasingly obvious that many countries have found a nice financial vehicle to pad up their budget. I mean, you mentioned Mexico. Mexico is getting $1.25 billion a year from their sugar tax. It's the country with the highest um, soda, Coca-Cola consumption per capita in the world, but we are not seeing, or maybe we're ignorant, or we need to look closer, any programs that improve health, any, any uh, projects that tell, for example, mothers how they should better improve the nutrition of the kids and not carry them, you know, in their thing with a Coca-Cola or a Pepsi when they're two years old. Um, I think, you know, that there's a lot of cloth to be cut there, but it's if, as if the problems we have about consumption of sugar were not serious enough and all these gratuitous criticism being banded around, this proliferation of sugar taxes, uh, pardon me, you know, if you are a minister of finance and you have a hole in your budget or you want to increase your expenditure, this is a tax that is easily collectible from one or two, three parties. Because in every country, it's Coca-Cola, Pepsi-Cola, and one, two more. And, and all of a sudden, you're looking like a star, you know. Uh, but is the overall health improving? Is there a scientific evidence to peg sugar uh, like it has been so far? You know, it's just disheartening to see the ease with which 
in certain countries, this flies and is, you know, bandied as the big success and the big thing. And, and later on, the results are just not there. And a lot of money is going somewhere that we can't see. You know, that's, I think, is a sad state of affairs. And we have one here for Marcelo. It's, um, it's talking, and, and I think we touched upon this uh, earlier. How do you see the evolution of ethanol and cane vis-a-vis -vis ethanol from Milo, from corn? I think... I think corn ethanol in Brazil has been uh, a growth, an important growth. I think we will have the production of corn ethanol in Brazil as a regular production. I think we will have both raw materials, sugarcane and corn, for specific areas of the center east of, of Brazil. The corn is very well uh, very well produced, the cost is competitive. So uh, we believe that we will have a growth in the corn ethanol production in Brazil. It will be very important to, to supply this huge demand we are expecting with sugarcane ethanol. Yes, I have been always impressed in recent years that, uh, for example, my friend, Dr. Plinio Nastari, has forged such a partnership with Sergio Ramalu and all of those guys from the, the corn sector. And at no point have I seen a, a boxing match or a, you do this, but I do it better. Um, it is, I think, a, an example to be learned from how they are walking together, facing the challenges, recognizing the difference, but conserving the main point, which is we are both producing renewable fuels that are good for the country, good for the planet. And this brings me to another question, and I'll open it up to the three of you. Um, it says, in addition to the benefits that the pandemic initially brought to sugar consumption, which Jack referred to, can we see the pandemic also contributing to a greater consumption of renewable fuels, which could favor sugar? You, yeah, gentlemen, what are your thoughts on that? Please, anyone. I can. I, Marcelo. I, yes. I think that the health side became very, very important for everybody during this pandemic. And I think that, that as biofuels play an important role in terms of health, pulmonary health, uh, lung health, I think that. Uh, we have an important role in terms of re the reduction of CO2. It's important. Everybody's worried about, about the, the situation of the emissions. But also, the, the role in health, in human health, that biofuel plays, I think it increased with the pandemic. Jack, are you? I think from the U.S. point of view, uh, there is still, you know, all of our ethanol is made from corn because uh, there's plenty of cheap corn available and demand has been, has been strong. And I think that one factor that will help ethanol production around the world uh, post-pandemic is somewhat related or not is the rising freight costs that we talked about. Mm -hmm. So countries that are already having trouble being able to afford fossil fuel imports are probably going to be turning more to the renewable fuels that they can source within their country. Uh, so I think that will be a, that will be a, a real plus. And, uh, you know, I think there's a, there's a really solid future for uh, ethanol around the world, whether it's from corn or uh, from sugar. And I'm, I'm very uh, hopeful about uh, uh, India's plans in that, in that regard. It's, uh, it's great to see out here's uh, presentation on, um, how strong the, the mandates are uh, in India and uh, what potential that has for absorbing the uh, uh, sugar surplus in India. Uh, yes, I, I think uh, what happened was that in India, we saw 
a definite fall in the consumption of fuel during the pandemic. Now, I believe we are now getting close to the levels we were uh, before the pandemic. But I can only endorse what Marcelo said that yes, the understanding is there that if you need to improve the environment, you need to go in for uh, ethanol blending. So that, that message seems to have gone across. So that, that should give a boost to our program where we still feel we have a long way to go. So uh, to, uh, to that extent, probably mm -hmm. our dependence on fossil fuels would uh, lessen and ethanol should get a boost from there. Thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> we've got some people here who obviously do some trading and they are asking all three of you, where do you see the market reaching by the March expiry position? If I knew I could retire, oh, oh but wait, I am retiring. So I guess I better learn. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm, I'm fairly bullish. I think that the, uh, the, the strength we're seeing uh, recently, I think may be borne out uh, for the next uh, few months, um, you know, particularly with uh, concerns about production in Brazil and some other countries. Uh, so I, you know, I see uh, the number 11 remaining in the high teens for the next few months, but I am an optimist at heart. <laughs> Thank you, Jack. Um, Marcelo, crystal ball gazing? I, would, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't dare to, to put a number, you know, because I think that's it's similar when you have exchange rate moving and then you have many, many people with many views from one to four. But I do believe we will have an appreciation in sugar price because every week when we evaluate Brazilian sugar cane behavior and impacts of, of frost and drought, the situation seems worse and worse. So I think we can expect a price appreciation for sure. I wouldn't, I wouldn't try to, to have a number, but I, I do believe we will have a price appreciation. Not just for March, but... I would have any comments? Yes, the point is we are happy with the current prices. I wouldn't hazard a guess as to where these levels would reach. But uh, on the other hand, I also feel that if we have some consistency in the prices, probably for traders it becomes simpler, at least at least from the Indian point of view. Because uh, the, the rapid rise that we have seen in the past week means that even millers are not willing to take a call. Because unlike Brazil, my millers will offer smaller quantities and they do not believe in hedging too much into the future. So, but I think the prices will be bullish. I mean, I, when I saw this question, I just opened up our, our daily sugar price tracker that my colleague Yvette Martin does. And I'm looking for example, the October position started the month at 1795. And it's yesterday, oh no, I'm sorry, on Friday, it was in 1995. Um, the March position, which the question uh, refers to, started at 1850 and is now at 20.52. So, you know, whatever is happening, we are applauding and cheering on this situation. Uh, we think it's great and uh, certainly a lot of smiles around. I have a blasphemous question here for Adir. I don't know if I'm going to say it. Is India looking forward to introduce a sugar tax? Hmm. Not really, not really. We are not looking uh, at a sugar tax in the near future. You see, uh, as I said, that 85% of my consumption is domestic. And uh, you must keep in mind that any rise in the domestic prices has political ramifications. So while there is a need for us to ensure that the sugarcane prices move up, I think the government is hesitant when it comes to increasing the sugar prices. So a sugar tax in that sense in uh, coming out of India would be a little uh, difficult to envisage at this stage. Good. We'll make sure we write to His Excellency Prime Minister Modi so that he eradicates the thought from his government's authorities. Huh? 
Uh, we also have a, a question, but I think we've touched about this. Someone is asking, what is the world perspective for India uh, to expand cane production to ethanol? I think, you know, I did cover that adequately. And are we walking towards a world of renewable fuels in a regional scale? What are your thoughts on that? Is it, you know, is it something, I mean, at ISO, we notice that as is logical, if you are a country that has great potential for renewable fuels, you will go in that route. If you are a country like Nigeria, who has abundant um, petroleum and whatever, your incentive, quote unquote, to look at renewable is much less. And I think that's just the nature of why God didn't make us twins. Uh, your comments on that. In the Indian context, and uh, when I talk of the Indian context, I look at the Indian subcontinent. Given our population uh, pressures, and therefore the requirement for food grains, uh, the food versus fuel debate will always be there. So while we are looking at surpluses to be moved to ethanol production, uh, it would be hard to really believe that we could really go ahead at renewable energy at uh, a higher pace than what we have really targeted. Okay. So this, this is going to be something that we will uh, have to look at as we go ahead. But uh, it, as of now, it seems uh, fairly difficult that we would be really be looking at renewable energy. In fact, uh, if you look at our energy program, I think we are more and more uh, moving into a direction where we are trying to tap solar energy as a source uh, as a source yeah pardon my ignorance Adil, but i mean having been in certain regions of your country is wind power taken off in india at all is it something that people consider for example in the canyons as you drive from gujarat into maharashtra where it's kind of like a wind tunnel is that taken off at all See, there, at, there was a time when a, a lot of investment was moving and a lot of uh, incentives had been given for wind energy. But uh, apparently the costing does not uh, appear to be very attractive because the move, and, and especially with the solar panels coming in a lot cheaper than earlier, mm -hmm. I, I think the focus now clearly is on solar energy rather than on wind energy. Well, good luck. And like you say, India has plenty of sun. I'm sure solar power in London won't catch on, but uh, that's not going to happen. Gentlemen, I, um, I want to thank you for your contributions, your insights, your thinking outside the box. And before we say goodbye to our audience, I would like to see if you have any parting thoughts you would like to leave us with, since Rogerio and Udob has entrusted us with crystal ball gazing towards 2030. Any final comments, Jack, Adir, Marcelo? I'd just like to thank you all for having me today. This is a really interesting discussion. And uh, I'll, uh, I'll be thinking of you even in, in retirement and rooting for the number 11 price. <laughs> thank I'd you. Like to wish Jack the best for his retirement. And it's been great being here. Must thank Rogerio and his team once again for giving us an opportunity to share our thoughts with the audience. Just to thank you for the, the opportunity and congratulate Adir and Jack for the presentations. Thank you. Well, thank you to all three of you and for putting in that extra effort in bringing relevance into our dialogue. And um, I think that, that the content of your presentations is a gold mine, but I like the combination between them and what one can extrapolate and bring up and sort of wonder about. Um, for me, it's been a pleasure uh, to moderate this. I think it's been a fertile exchange and, and that's what it's all about. I mean, the objective of these uh, types of events is precisely to exchange ideas, try to bring in fresh thoughts, and hopefully in areas like the war against sugar, to band together more strongly and speak of the same hymn sheet and dispel all this falsehoods, I'm going to use a, a proper word, uh, that we see spewing around. So, Rogerio, back to you. Thank you very much. Muito obrigado, Dr. Orive. Agradeço também os demais panelistas pela participação, né, pela contribuição, sem dúvida alguma, 
é, um divisor de águas para o nosso evento, já realizado há 14 anos, né, o Congresso Nacional da Bioenergia, considerado o maior evento técnico do setor de bioenergia aqui do Brasil e do mundo. Né? É, nossos sinceros agradecimentos em nome da nossa diretoria, do nosso presidente Amaury Beckman, do nosso presidente executivo, Antônio César Salib, né? muito obrigado, doutor Urive. É, vale ressaltar que o doutor Urive está de férias, né? É, em seu país de origem, né, na Guatemala, mas interrompeu as férias para poder é, compartilhar um pouco é, da sua experiência, sua extraordinária experiência, né, à frente é, da Associação Internacional do Açúcar. Muito obrigado, né, é, doutor Orive, é, por sua participação, pela sua enorme contribuição aqui conosco, é, moderando o nosso painel. Nosso agradecimento também ao doutor Mancini, né, Marcelo Mancini Estela, vice-presidente de Comercial Logística do Grupo Atlas ao Jack Rony, nosso diretor de Economia e Análise Política né, na American Sugar, a quem a gente deseja, né, doravante, uma nova é, é, extraordinária né, é, aposentadoria, com certeza é, pôde contribuir muito a todo o setor, não apenas nos Estados Unidos, como no mundo todo. Muito obrigado. Né? E também o doutor Adir Jha, é, pela visão da Índia, que muito é, nos agregou aqui é, pela ESEC. Muito obrigado em nome dos organizadores, né? gostaríamos de agradecer sinceramente, e dizer que esse painel vai ficar disponível nas plataformas da UDOP, do YouTube, né? nosso canal do YouTube, é, nas versões é, em inglês e em português também. Convidar a todos, enfim, para encerrar, né? convidar a todos para o nosso próximo painel, aqui do 14º Congresso Nacional da Bioenergia, que acontece hoje, às 14 horas, agora na sala de gestão em segurança e saúde no trabalho, com o tema geral, a segurança do trabalho que faz sentido. Então, vamos discutir alguns assuntos é, pertinentes a essa área de gestão e segurança e saúde do trabalho. O Congresso da UDOP vai até a próxima sexta-feira, com dois painéis, duas lives diárias, sempre às 10 e às 14 horas. Muito obrigado a todos, mais uma vez, obrigado, e uma ótima semana a todos nós. Os produtos da Copert estão nos maiores produtores rurais hoje, de, em grandes grupos de cana-de-açúcar e inserido nos manejos de alta produtividade do setor. A minha área inteira consiste em 4.400 hectares, nessa propriedade que a gente está montando de campo aqui, demonstrando aqui o trabalho fantástico dos biológicos aí. Hoje aqui a gente está tirando uma cana aí de 24 toneladas de açúcar por hectare. Então, a gente está, além de buscar um manejo mais sustentável, buscando produtividade com qualidade. Uma produção em alta escala dá a tranquilidade que o produtor precisa para a produção agrícola dele, ou seja, contar com a empresa e a disponibilidade de produto faz todo o sentido na confiança e no, na procedência. E a Corporate em si, ela me levou a conhecer os bastidores, mostrou um trabalho fantástico de pesquisa, desenvolvimento, formulação, e tudo aquilo que eu vi de qualidade lá que a gente está vendo aqui entregando no campo. Nosso grupo de pesquisa dentro da universidade vem desenvolvendo trabalhos nessa linha. Uh, existem vários produtos no mercado, evidentemente que alguns se destacam em relação aos efeitos uh, como bioestimulante. O tricodermil é um biofungicida e bionematicida de alta performance. Além do efeito de controle contra os patógenos, o tricodermil atua também como bioestimulante. O produto tricodermil é bastante interessante hoje para ser utilizado já desde o início, que também nós vamos ter aí a ação dele disponibilizando nutrientes. O tricograma galó é uma microvespa parasitóide dos ovos da broca da cana, 
e por ele fazer o controle dos ovos, ele antecipa o dano dela. A utilização em grande escala foi possível por conta da tecnologia de liberação dos drones, que a torna a liberação ágil, confiável e de excelente custo-benefício. O Golai Bug, a gente pode utilizar ele então para prever, anteceder o controle, o que é excelente. E o residual dele é muito longo. Agora, o Metahil, ele é um produto bastante interessante para controle da cigainha das raízes. Nesse caso, a gente usa o associado com inseticida ou o produto exatamente ali em cima da cigarrinha. Vantagem dele é que ele vai persistindo de um ano para outro. Aqui nós temos um ensaio onde desse lado nós temos o tratamento com o portfólio Cooper, utilizando o Tricodermil e o Rodster. Nós podemos notar aqui uma maior quantidade de perfilhos, um maior porte da cana em relação ao outro tratamento, onde nós percebemos falhas. E tudo isso devido ao efeito bioestimulante, tanto do tricodermil quanto do rodster, que é o nosso ascofilos, é uma alga marinha que proporciona todo um efeito bioestimulante para o canavial. Essa é uma prática já bastante usual, Uh, com os produtores de alto, alta produtividade. Uh, a gente mesmo, como produtor de cana, utiliza essas tecnologias, ou seja, o uso de bioestimulantes. A validação de especialistas que falam e são criteriosos com aquilo que se é feito, né, levam para a afirmação que biológico hoje é sim uma opção segura. Tem padrão de mercado, que tem qualidade e que está demonstrando aquilo que vocês estão vendo aqui, né? Produtividade e qualidade. A vida é como andar de bicicleta. Para manter o equilíbrio, você precisa estar em movimento. Mas no mundo de hoje não é tão fácil. E a vida parece que às vezes fica fora do eixo, com opiniões se tornando tão extremas quanto o nosso clima e quando não há comida suficiente para alguns e em abundância para outros. Todos nós queremos equilíbrio em casa, no trabalho, em nossa alimentação e principalmente no meio ambiente. Porque cuidar da terra e do bem-estar das pessoas é um ato de equilíbrio como nenhum outro. Equilibrando oferta, demanda, o meio ambiente, e o nosso sustento. Bom, e se a questão for mudar a maneira como pensamos? E se fizermos as perguntas certas e encontrarmos as respostas corretas? Sabendo que a primeira solução nunca é a última. E se equilíbrio for ter certeza que não fazemos de mais ou de menos? E se entendermos os desafios e enxergarmos as oportunidades em igual medida, os enfrentando com criatividade e coragem? E se equilíbrio não for ficar parado? E sim, ainda encontrar tempo para parar? Para pensar? Para aprender. Gerando novas ideias com orgulho e sabendo quando ouvir com humildade. Inovação é a resposta? E se equilíbrio for trabalhar com a natureza assim como para ela? Safra após safra, geração após geração, sabendo que uma ideia é apenas uma ideia até que seja comprovada no campo. E se for sobre fazer o certo e não o mais fácil? Reconhecendo que nenhum de nós pode resolver tudo sozinho. As necessidades de alimentar o nosso planeta e cuidar dele dependem do equilíbrio de todos, confiando uns nos outros, respeitando uns aos outros. Porque é assim que a vida funciona. Às vezes é difícil. Às vezes é emocionante e incrível, mas nunca devemos parar. Então assim como andar de bicicleta, continuaremos seguindo em frente, encontrando o equilíbrio ideal para o sucesso dos agricultores, da agricultura e das próximas gerações. BASF. We create chemistry.